because we are nothing without you. We would not exist if it were not for you. And so, Lord, as we continue to there's a hanger in here, isn't there? as we continue in this journey with you, Lord, just continue to teach us, teach us more of who you are and who you are calling us to be. And we say this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, it's a glorious day, and we are thankful that each of you have chosen to be with us here today. And so, as I was asking the Lord what to speak on this week, you know, I was reflecting on last week's challenge, and it was a little bit more of a heavier word, and so I was like, well, okay, you know, what would be a good encouraging word for us this week? And, and he just said, you know, speak on faithfulness. Not just about his faithfulness, in fact, emphasis, emphasize our faithfulness in this. So I thought, great, that's awesome, that should be a great encouraging word, and as I started to dig into it, Yes, it is encouraging, but there is some heat to it as well. So um, get ready for it. Christy shakes her head. And where is this coming from? So, but I've been pondering this word faithful for a little while, and part of it has been a colleague of mine um, spoke on this word often, and most often referencing how we need to hold faithfully to the word in all of our preaching and teaching. Because um, certainly that is a place where the church more and more is being challenged about how to speak faithfully into our culture. Um, and so I really come to appreciate this call of my colleague um, in an increasing measure. And so most often when we think of the word faithful or faithfulness, you know, we most often attribute that to the Lord, right? He is faithful. And he is good, as we've sung in many of the songs today. That is the character of who he is. And that while that is true, and he is the one who actually demonstrates that consistently, the question is, how are we also to be faithful? Because we are created in his image. And so if that is who he is, that is who he is calling us also to be. We are called to live in his ways. And so faithfulness should be a part of what we are striving for as a body, as individuals. So as I started this, I was like, okay, well, let's do a word search on the word faithful or faithfulness, you know, what are derivative of that. And the Bible does speak about this quite a lot. There's over 200 references to that word in scripture. Um, while many are attributing that to the traits of who God is, there are also many people identified within Scripture um, that are noted as being faithful. So I'm just going to do a very brief kind of gathering of who was identified in that way. Um, most are noted as this from the Old Testament. And so the first one noted in scripture as being faithful is Enoch. You know, what's the big story around Enoch? Anybody know? 
He didn't die. But other than that, that's all we know about Enoch. Yes. Yeah. Right? But again, that's Methuselah's story, right? We don't hear a lot in scripture about Enoch. And so it's very interesting because just as, you know, what it is, is it's being noted as a genealogy, essentially, from Adam to Noah. And he is the only one in that genealogy that is noted as faithfully walking with God. Interesting that his whole legacy is around faithfulness. And yet there's no story to go with that in the scriptures that have been canonized. Um, and so he did not die this natural death. This is only one of two people who did not die a natural death throughout biblical history. And so that is obviously a noted thing. Um, and this legacy is even noted in Hebrews. Again, there's no backstory, but Hebrews notes this as well, as one who did not experience death. And so he's commended as one who pleased God. And so that's quite a story for one who did not get hardly any mention throughout scripture. Um, but what we can take from this is that our life does not have to be profound. You don't have to be some highlight preacher who gets all the airtime and, and has your story known around the world. Your life does not have to reflect that. But your faithfulness can be noted. And that can hold throughout history. So the next ones mentioned in the Old Test Testament narratives are not, not necessarily surprising as they're often the stories that we hold on to as you know, holding some pretty clear examples of being faithful. So Noah is noted in Genesis 6, 9 as righteous, blameless, and he walked faithfully with God. And in his case, we can see why he would have that reputation. You know, he takes anywhere from 40 to 100 years as kind of the, the debate in order to build a boat. And it's not noted that he's building a boat on the shoreline, you know, of the ocean, and it's this massive structure. Um, and it's pretty speculated that he likely experienced a fair bit of ridicule for building this big boat. <laughs> Nowhere near the water. I saw it on a movie. You saw it in a movie. You know, so as far as we know, you know, again, he wasn't near the ocean, and so this boat structure would not have exactly had a lot of value. Um, and so, but yet Noah believed that the Lord saw his faithfulness and was entrusting something to him that was actually entrusting the life of humanity to him. Mm -hmm. Wow, no pressure there. But he faithfully built this boat over, and, you know, for years it took to build this structure. Abram, when the Lord appeared before him in Genesis 17, called him to walk before me faithfully and blameless. And so, again, there's no clear scripture that says he was noted to fulfill that call. But we know the story of Abram and later referred to as Abraham. We can see again, it was clear he was faithful. And he faithfully obeyed all that the Lord had given him. The Lord made a covenant with him that his family would become a nation of God's chosen people. Again, wow. Upon the deliverance from Egypt, Moses received instructions from the Lord in Deuteronomy 11, and he was being challenged to faithfully obey all the commands given from the Lord to love and to serve him with all of your heart, all of your soul. And so again, we can glean from this that this is the way to be faithful, obedience, and love with all of who we are. Again, we can go on in the history lesson here and talk about Joshua and King David and Hezekiah and Nehemiah. I'm not going to go into all their stories, though. 
Um, but as this kind of shift in scripture, we see small notations in some of the prophets that begin proclaiming someone else who is going to be faithful. And this is one that's going to establish a new throne. Isaiah 16 says, In faithfulness a man will sit on it, one from the house of David. And so this is the beginning of the Lord bringing revelation of the Messiah, the one who is going to save God's people. And so it can be pretty easy to separate Old Testament concepts from the New Testament, and we need to remember that the New Testament is the fulfillment of God's intent for his people. And so that means that everything that God saw as faithful in the Old Testament is still how he sees faithfulness in the New. And so Jesus was obviously the one who was being prophesied. He was the Messiah, and he spent much of his ministry not only sharing about the kingdom of God and discipling the Twelve and later more. He spent time healing and delivering people. But he also spent a fair bit of time contending with the religious leaders of the day. And so what is notable, some of what Jesus had to say here, is that it is important to talk about being faithful, even among the church. This is not just a word for unbelievers. This is a word for those who proclaim that they are following the Lord. Because there are people who think they are being faithful, but in fact they are not so Matthew chapter 23 is Jesus calling out the religious leaders with the seven woes. And essentially this starts in verse 3, saying that they do not practice what they preach. And so he's calling out their hypocrisy. And verse 23 lays it out to say, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without rejecting the former. And essentially, this is saying they didn't understand what it actually means to be faithful. They thought it was all about just following the rules and at times following them proudly or very openly, making a big deal about their uh, adherence to the Old Testament law. But Jesus goes on to say about them, you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. And so in the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are filled with hypocrisy and, and wickedness. So we have to get really very real with this word, that being faithful is not what it looks like. It doesn't need to look like you have it all together in order to be faithful. But too many people set that as their goal. So on Sunday, they come dressed right, they say the right things, they raise their hands in worship, but they're a mess on the inside. They are actually living for themselves and not for the Lord. So in reality, none of us probably has it fully right here. As blessed of people as you are, I'm sure none of you are completely unmessed on the inside. We are all working on that. Um, but what Jesus was calling out was this facade of faithfulness. A facade that was actually not all about getting yourself into positions of authority, wearing the right clothes, sitting with the right people, being a prominent giver of money, or even saying all the right things. No, what faithfulness looks like is looking a lot more like Jesus. Jesus was controversial. He rocked the boat. 
He approached the uncomfortable people. But he also showed mercy to those who didn't look like they needed it. He got to know the people that were there. So being faithful is highlighted in a couple of parables in Matthew chapter 25. So we're just kind of progressing a little bit through Matthew. And the first parable I'm not going to touch on. It's the parable of the ten virgins. But the second parable is the parable of the talents. And so I'm going to read that starting at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received five bags of gold went at once to put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, but the man who had received the one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, and see, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two, and see, I have gained two more. And again the master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received one bag bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with at least some interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten. For whoever has will be given more, and they will, be, they, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I know we've all heard that parable many, many, many times. And... Just to be clear, this is not a parable about making good investments. (laughs) You may think it is, but it is not. This is a parable about being faithful. And it's also important to note that it's not, um, it was not expected that we would all have the same work to do. The talent or gold, other versions say silver, was given according to their ability. It's an interesting phrase that it often gets overlooked in the telling of this story, but being faithful is not about having the same outcome as the other person. You don't have to produce the same as someone else. You are being asked to be faithful with what is being given to you. And so it may be you're being faithful in helping out in ch- a church in some way, or maybe you're being faithful in your workplace or in your community in some other way, or maybe it's just being faithful with your family, or is your call to pray faithfully. 
Where are you being asked to be a light? Is it sharing your testimony? Is it sharing the gospel faithfully? Again, we are not all being asked to do the same thing. We can also glean from this that our result will not be measured against the results of others, but it will be measured. That is the key. It will be measured what you did with your talent. Will the Lord acknowledge your faithfulness? Or will it be considered to be that wicked and lazy servant? Please, Lord, let that not be me. But Jesus goes on to tell another parable. I'm not going to read it all, but in essence, it's to tell people how simple it is to be faithful. And he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Remember the reprimand to the Pharisees we read earlier. They missed out what was important. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. And this is exactly what Jesus was referring to here. Caring for those who are in need. Having mercy on those who need mercy. Being hospitable. Noticing there are other people around you that often are overlooked and unnoticed. So maybe you're being asked to do more than just this simple baseline looking after others. But we are also asked to pay attention to the simple ways that we can walk out being faithful. We are all being given something according to our ability. Maybe it's not possible for you to do prison visitations. But can you offer a drink? Can you offer food? Do you have anything extra that you can bring faithfully for the Lord? Because as that parable says, is that it's not necessarily that you knew it was the Lord. Because if you knew you were serving the Lord something faithfully, you would probably be doing it ambitiously. But he says that you if you're doing it unto the least of these, you are doing it to me. And so we don't, it's often in those that we don't see that we have to be faithful with. But remember, you can't just be doing these things to look good. You can't just be <coughs> serving faithfully for appearances. You have to be doing it because you are being faithful to your Lord and Savior. Faithful to God. And so Jesus got in trouble all the time. Why? Because he reached out to the outcasts. And the outcasts were not just the lepers that he healed, but it was also dining with the tax collectors. And so Jesus found himself with all kinds of people from all walks of life. Why? Because they didn't know about the love of God. The lepers were social outcasts because of their disease. And so they were separated from society. They lived on the outskirts of the city. They didn't have a choice in that matter. But the tax collectors, on the other hand, they chose to be outcasts. Why? Because of their greed. They would turn their backs on their own people to collect taxes for Rome. And so they were hated among their own people. But Jesus knew that they all needed this reminder. They all needed to be taught about the kingdom of God. And it's likely 
that they all forgot about the love and mercy of God. But Jesus was there to remind them. And so we need to be asking ourselves, so who do we need to faithfully share about the kingdom of God? Are you using those opportunities that God provides for you? And if the answer is not all the time, then we have to ask, well, why not? Why are you not seizing those moments? Is it that you're too busy for their kind? Are they the outcasts of your heart? Are you afraid of showing yourself to be a believer at work? Will you, will you be, are you afraid of being accused of proselytizing and getting fired? Then you have to ask yourself, well, what am I called to in that situation? Am I actually called to stand on a chair and preach to your coworkers? Probably not. But are, but are you, are you supposed to get to know your coworkers and actually know what their story is, know them well enough to know about their life struggles? And then can you faithfully pray for them? Can you lend them a hand? Maybe they need a hand moving or getting groceries, giving them a ride to and from work then when they have a need, who are they going to call? The faithful ones. Those that have been there for them in the difficult times. Those that know that this is beyond just a professionalism relationship, but this is a place, a relationship where you genuinely carry something that others don't. And that is you are carrying the faithfulness of your service to the Lord. There's a somewhat famous psychological study, actually, that's been done on uh, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the way this study was set up was to have preachers getting ready to, to do a sermon on the parable. And so they're, they have time to prepare, and they come to the study, and then, in essence, the, the crux of it is, is they're being rushed to give this sermon. And so they create different um, timelines for how rushed they are. So one, one person is not rushed at all. They have time to get there. The other one's told that, oh, we're running late, you know, five minutes late. So, you know, we really need to get going. Another one is told we're like really late. We're like 15 minutes but each of them encounter someone in need along the way. So remember, they are primed up with what it is to stop and care for someone. But depending on the condition that in which they had, if they had time, they would stop. But as soon as they were late for their sermon, they too would pass by the person in need. You know, so it just is a it's really neat study of just showing how it doesn't matter what's on your mind as you're going about your day. It's about whether what's more important. Is it more important that you're getting and rushing through your day, or is it more important that you see the one in need? And that you're willing to set aside your agendas in order to pause and do what the Lord has presented an opportunity for you to do. So there are hurting people around us, and Jesus loves them. And he wants us to love them. He wants us to see them and value them for what they have, what they have to bring and, and to see from that other perspective that was being brought up in worship today to see from the higher perspective those people that are, we're running into in life. So as I was preparing this, I had to do good 
deep reflection in my own life as to how busy am I and how much do I miss those opportunities. And I just hope that this is a, a, a word that challenges you as well to go, what am I being faithful to? And what is the Lord calling me to do as well? Because maybe you have been one of those people that's been in judgment of others and you've missed the opportunity that's been, been presented to you. Or maybe you have felt like an outcast and you have given up on God because of the hypocrisy that you have seen in others who claim this love for people and yet see lots of other fruit come out of their life. Whichever way it is, today can be a day to make it right. Today can be a day of re-evaluating and saying, Lord, I want to be faithful in every way you show me. Lord, I want to be noted just for my faithfulness in the simple ways in which you present those opportunities. And so I'm just going to say a prayer and just in your heart, however this word has um, been challenging to you, just pray in agreement with it. But Lord, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, in that you see us and you actually have plans for us to be touching people's lives faithfully. And Lord, we want to, again, be faithful not to, to be an impression upon people for ourselves, but we want to be an impression of you. We want ourselves to not even be remembered, actually. But at the end of the day, the people know that you sent someone to them. And so, Lord, we just pray for forgiveness in any way that we have not been faithful to the call. Any time that we have had opportunity and we had that thing in our spirit that said, this is your moment, and we overlooked it. But, Lord, we also pray if there's any way that we have given up on God, any way that we have just thought that you don't see me. But Lord, you have brought us here today. And so we thank you because that in itself says, you see me. And so Lord, we just pray, if we have felt unseen, Lord, today we thank you that you see me. In any way that I've given up on you, Lord, I want to I turn to you again. Lord, I want to be faithful. I want you to be the one I serve. And I want to serve you faithfully. And so, Lord, show me what do I need to do. Is there anything in the way of me being faithful towards you? Am I too busy? Am I holding on to judgments? Lord, help me to make time. Help me to just be obedient and listen to your spirit as I walk through the day. Lord, help me to let go of those judgments of others, those hypocrites. Lord, may I not be that. Pull any kind of hypocrisy out of me, Lord Jesus. But Lord, maybe I've not been turning to you in my sufferings, in my difficulties. Well, today, Lord, I turn my heart to you. I want to follow you. I want to be faithful to you. And so, Lord, show me the way. Show me what I need to set down for you. Show me what, uh, how to turn to you in those times of suffering. Show me how to turn to you as I need to cope with life. And maybe what I'm turning to to get through the day is not of you. And so, Lord, help me to see your 
way. Put people in my life that will respond to you so that they can build me up and call me to that higher way of seeing life. Lord, we all need you. We all need to be led by your spirit. So Lord, help us to be noted as faithful and blameless. And so Lord, we give our all to you. We give you all of our heart. We give you all of our soul, all of our minds so that we can be faithful to you. And so Lord Jesus, we can't do this without you. Help us, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to just truly know, to truly see what you need us to see. Help us to, again, hold on to that truth that we are yours and that you direct our steps. You show us what we need to see in life. So, Lord, just forgive us for seen only through our own eyes. We want to be faithful. And so, Lord, we just pray this in the name of Jesus, that we would reflect you and that you would be the remembered one. In Jesus' name.